Great. Yeah. So let me just um, welcome everybody and then do a quick introduction and then I'll hand it over um, to Professor Tubbs. I don't think I need to give much of a, uh, a biographical background because I think many of the people in this room had him as a professor. But as you all know, he's been teaching at King since 2005, um, teaches constitutional law, public policy, um, which is, I hope, very much going to inform the discussion today about Justice Barrett and the Supreme Court. Um, I'm, you know, as a lawyer who lives in DC, I, you know, kind of feel like I'm in the thick of it, uh, of this discussion every day. And so I'm very excited to hear a bit more of an academic discussion of it rather than one that may be, you know, a little more politically fraught with people here in DC. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what um, Professor Tubbs has to say about um, the state of constitutional law now, um, the state of constitutional law going forward. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take about 15 or so minutes, I think, um, uh, maybe I think he said 15 minutes of discussion, um, some prepared remarks, and then we're gonna open it up for discussion. Uh, if you have questions as, you, as he's speaking, um, feel free to throw them in the chat box. And when he's done, I will you know, direct some of these questions to him. But I think, you know, there's, 25 people in the room, we might get a few more as we go. Um, I think we can also try to have a little bit more in-person discussion uh, as things progress. Um, so to keep things orderly, um, please keep your mute function on uh, unless you have a question to ask. If you have a question and don't wanna put it in the chat, feel free to you know, either send me a private chat and I can call on you, or I'll keep an eye out for people who look like they're just champing at the bit to say something. And we will do our best to facilitate a, uh, a good and fruitful discussion here. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Tubbs and look forward to hearing from him. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and um, thanks everyone for showing up. I'm, I'm, I'm flattered by um, your presence. So uh, I thought about how to uh, uh, present this or frame uh, what I wanted to say. And um, my first inclination was I would just make five minutes worth of remarks and then open it up for discussion. And this was based on last year. I led one of these sessions uh, that took place in a real classroom at King's. And so I didn't speak that long and uh, we, had, we had good discussion. Last year was about the future of the constitution. There was an article in Harper's Magazine last year that appeared a late kind of summer about the future of the constitution. And so uh, we scanned it and sent to everybody, sent it to everybody who signed up for, for my breakout session. And I think most of them read it. And so it was pretty good. This year, I just thought, well, why not talk about uh, the um, confirmation hearings for judge, now Justice Barrett, and uh, talk a little bit about the future of the Supreme Court. And so I'm gonna maybe surprise some of you by my emphases and my remarks. Um, and some of you took con law with me quite a while ago. Um, those of you who have taken it more recently, what I'm about to say at the beginning will be familiar to you. And this I regard as, um, uh, I think it's an improvement in my teaching. Um, I, I, I worry about complacency with many things in life and I don't want to get, ever get complacent with respect to my teaching. So I ask myself, what, what fundamentally am I trying to achieve in teaching different courses, especially, but not only constitutional law? And I think I've been saying this now for about five years. Um, so if you took con law with me maybe before 2015 or 2014, you might not have heard this. But what, what I'm emphasizing in recent years, right at the beginning of the semester, what I say the goal of the course is, is to um, help the students acquire constitutional literacy. I want the students to become constitutionally literate. And I don't know if I said that really before 2014 or 2015. Does it sound familiar to you, Chris, Alexandra? I, I, I don't think I started using it until a few years ago. Um, um, but that really is the goal. And you know, it, it is gratifying to me when a former student tells me, well, I watched the confirmation hearings and I could follow pretty much everything. And I didn't go to law school, so I feel really good that I was able to kind of understand all the references and, and I'm watching it and friends are asking me questions and, and so I'm, I'm answering questions my, for, for friends. Um, and so that, that means a lot to me. And that, that really upon reflection is what I think my goal is in teaching the course um, in large part because I fear that a significant part of the nation uh, 
is approaching constitutional illiteracy. Um, and this, I don't think, is the way it should be. Um, and I would cite very quickly um, uh, someone like Tocqueville as evidence in support of my view that, that Tocqueville in his travels in the United States in the, uh, in the 1830s, he was just struck by the knowledge that so many Americans <clears throat> Constitution and you know, raises a big question, well, what happened, what happened? So one, one perspective I had on the, uh, the confirmation hearings and all the commentary, commentary that was generated by the confirmation hearing, one, one perspective, maybe for me right now, the, the most important perspective is, well, what do these discussions tell us about the level of constitutional literacy in the United States today? Um, and um, that's a broad question and it would be, it would be hard uh, to answer it definitively. One hopes, at least I hope, that confirmation hearings can raise the level of constitutional literacy that, that, that Americans who watch, um, particularly who tune in as often as possible, that, that they really will acquire knowledge of the Constitution uh, in the Supreme Court. Um, but there's always a possibility that people will watch and none of it will register with them because they've been so influenced by uh, other voices even before they before they turn the television on or you know access it on their computer or phone um, so 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 here are th uh, five um, signs I, I humbly submit to you um, as evidence of constitutional literacy um, if if we could identify um, commentators who were clear on all of these matters, say somebody who wanted to write about the Senate confirmation hearings. I'm guessing many of you saw it, you know, uh, right after um, Judge Barrett was nominated. So the Wall Street Journal in the weekend edition, they had a long piece by, um, what's his name? Uh, the attorney, uh, David French, right? And he talks about history of confirmation hearings and so forth. And, um, yeah, you know, I read it and I thought he did he did a good job, uh, but I've read so many other commentaries that leave me dismayed because I find the commentaries misleading. And my worry is that the commentary, some of the commentaries are um, damaging the, the effort to raise a level of constitutional literacy. Um, and some of these people know better. That's what I guess is most upsetting to me. Some of these people know better or they, if, if they didn't have an agenda, I'm sh quite sure they would concede some of these points. But my view is, if you're going to be a commentator on uh, confirmation hearings and uh, the Constitution, if you're going to be a commentator now, considering all the divisions are in our society. My, my, my hope would be that you would try very hard um, to be as accurate and thorough as possible allowing for the fact that, of course, every writer has space limits, right? You know, you write something for a newspaper or a website, you're told you've allowed this many words and so forth, right? So I would hope that if you can't cover all that you want to cover, whatever you do cover, you would do so accurately and thoroughly. And if, you know, things you can't cover that you wanted to cover, you take those up uh, another time, rather than uh, introduce uh, potential or indisputable confusions to, to the people reading your piece. So I wanna give you um, five points, five things that I think would reflect constitutional literacy. Um, if we saw these in a commentary and it could be a verbal commentary, uh, it could be, for example, a Senator questioning uh, Judge Barrett, um, or it could be somebody writing about what took place. and. I'm giving you these five because I think these are important things if we're gonna have as a nation um, a more informed discussion about the Constitution and the Supreme Court. Um, and um, I would hope that you would say, yes, these are important signs of constitutional literacy and um, we can use these and perhaps add others to the list as reference points when we want to talk, not only about the Constitution and the future of the Supreme Court, 
but whether commentators are discharging the responsibility seriously in, in discussing um, the Constitution and the Supreme Court. So, so without further ado, here are, here are five signs of constitutional literacy as I see them, okay? So the first would be knowledge of the different bases of state and federal laws. Knowledge of the different bases of state and federal laws. So those of you who had constitutional law with me, I, I hope even if you didn't go to law school, you, you haven't forgotten this, right? Um, state legislation uh, coming from a state legislature, uh, grounded in the reserve powers of the states, the state legislatures, the authorities of state legislatures to promote uh, uh, public health, safety, and morals in the common good, commonly called state legislature's exercise of the police powers. Uh, by contrast, every time Congress makes a law, it is to be grounded in some power granted to it uh, in the Constitution. Um, I would hope that all commentators would acknowledge this difference. So for example, I, I mentioned this as a, as a reference point, much of the controversy about the Affordable Care Act seems to take for granted on the part of many commentators that Congress can make a law on any subject it wishes, okay? But I think that that um, misleads many people because it's just not true. As for example, the Lopez decision um, clearly indicates. So that's first sign of constitutional literacy. Second, closely related, closely related that um, there is a distinction between the desirability of a, of a policy and the question of its constitutionality. There are a lot of policies that I would hope Americans could say, I don't like that policy, it's stupid, but it's constitutional, okay? There used to be a tradition in American constitutional scholarship of you know, commentators making fun of policies that they didn't like and sort of grudgingly saying, but they're constitutional, right? I don't like it if I wanna change it, you know, like-minded citizens and I, we've got to work to persuade the legislature to change it. This to me is just fundamental, right? Um, and more than, uh, this might be my most acute worry that, that so many people, when it comes to the, the Supreme Court and the future of the Supreme Court, they look at it and they say, I just don't like what it's doing as though it is some uh, mini legislature. Um, and, they find it objectionable and they weigh in, even if the distinction I just mentioned um, um, is, is entirely alien to them. They have no awareness of that distinction. Okay, uh, third point. Um, I would be grateful if everybody who writes about the constitution and the act of interpreting the constitution would acknowledge that constitutional provisions exist on a spectrum. On one side of the spectrum, you have provisions that admit of virtually no ambiguity, no ambiguity whatsoever, say like the presidential age requirement. And then the, the other side, you have provisions that admit of considerable ambiguity. It doesn't mean that um, they're unintelligible. It doesn't mean that you know, we can't um, uh, understand them through different kinds of research, but there are provisions of perfect clarity. And then on the other side, of the, spectrum, you have provisions with considerable ambiguity that you know, would pause anybody reading the Constitution for the first time or you know, maybe the hundredth time, but who doesn't have specialized knowledge about how to um, penetrate certain provisions, the person would say, well, I don't know how you get at that, right? You know, uh, imagine a, a, a citizen who's engaged in politics, doesn't have a background in law and reads the due process clause. I don't know quite what that means. How do you, how do you get at that, right? But the point would be you would want commentators to acknowledge you have the spectrum, you have the spectrum. One side of the spectrum, considerable ambiguity, the other side, essentially no ambiguity whatsoever. Fourth, um, a sign of constitutional literacy. Uh, it, would be, it would be valuable if commentators writing about the Constitution and the Supreme Court would acknowledge that the Supreme Court in our history has at times significantly contributed to the polarization of the country, significantly contributed. I, I don't know 
whether any historian believes that the Dred Scott decision caused the Civil War. I've, I've, I've not heard scholars make that argument, but I do know many scholars believe that after the Dred Scott decision, the Civil War was probably a foregone conclusion. And so it would be good for Americans trying to understand the workings of the Supreme Court, the, 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 the act of constitutional interpretation, to understand that sometimes uh, in the past, uh, the consequences of erroneous interpretations by the Supreme Court have been extremely high. Um, and that the Supreme Court, not only during that era, contributed to the polarization of, of the country, but in other periods as well. The Gilded Age, for example, the controversy involved with uh, finding uh, uh, the, the right, the, the putative right of a liberty of contract lurking in the 14th Amendment due process clause. That contributed to a different kind of polarization in the country, um, though I would argue that the Dred Scott uh, and the sectional crisis that gave way to the Civil War was, um, <clears throat> was a more consequential crisis. And then finally, and this is asking a lot, when, my, my fifth sign of constitutional literacy, it, wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful if anybody who's commenting on theories of constitutional interpretation and the best method to interpret the Constitution, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody who did this was able to avoid egregious errors in characterizing the different theories of constitutional interpretation or the different methods of constitutional interpretation. Wouldn't it be fabulous if you could read an article by a living constitutionalist, you know, somebody who identifies as a living constitutionalist, and that person could accurately describe originalism and not, you know, distort it such that, you know, a reader would say, how could anybody take originalism seriously based on this account of it? Okay. So those are what I propose as uh, five criteria um, as, as, as a way of assessing the level of constitutional literacy um, um, in particular persons and uh, uh, in communities, including, including the community, the whole political community. Now, why did I think about this? Because I was reading so much commentary and, and so much of the commentary um, um, struck me as um, flawed according to those five criteria. Um, so I make one obvious point. Um, I think some of these people know better. They have to know better, right? They have to know better. So for instance, Washington Post, maybe some of you read it. Um, he's been commenting on constitutional matters for a long time. He's a historian at, at Stanford. His name is Jack, Jack Rakoff. Um, Rakoff, in characterizing um, originalism, and Judge Barrett, now Justice Barrett's originalism. Rakoff makes that mistake of, but is it really a mistake? Little aside, um, suggesting that every provision in the Constitution has some ambiguity there. And my response to that is he knows better. It's just, it's just simply not true. He knows better. Um, he wants to emphasize as a historian, somebody who does intellectual history on the late 18th century in the United States, he wants to emphasize that a lot of words and terms had uh, a very different meaning in the context of late, into, late 18th century America. I accept that, I accept it. Go ahead, make arguments based on your knowledge, but don't suggest to your readers in an op-ed piece in the Washington Post that every part of the constitution is ambigu ambiguous, right? Don't, don't, uh, don't suggest that there's there's ambiguity everywhere you look in the Constitution because it's not true. Um, more recent King's graduates, you probably know I've I've zeroed in on that part of the essay by Justice Brennan. I, I say this: I teach students. I feel it's my duty as as a professor to teach students about the debate between originalist and living constitutionalist. And I do believe that the Scalia essay and the Brennan essay are still fundamental. They're, they're pivotal essays. So much derives from those two essays. Uh, the fact they were both published in the 1980s, they are reference points for so much of the subsequent discussion. But I, I have felt constrained in recent years, I think like the last five or six years, to say, look, Brennan is just mis misleading some of his readers and suggesting that every part of the Constitution is ambiguous. And so that's when I started with students in the Con Law course, emphasizing the spectrum, emphasizing the spectrum, okay? Then um, 
This comes from the New York Times, October 16th of this year. Um, I think he's a regular columnist, uh, Jamel Bowie, um, writing about um, uh, Judge Barrett's originalism. The title of his essay was, which constitution is Amy Coney Barrett talking about? Her originalism ignores the significance of the second American revolution by which he means the civil war and the ratification of the uh, 13th, 14th and 15th amendment. And this to me, the decision to publish this piece, I, I would just strongly criticize the New York Times editorial team. Uh, I, if you can find any originalist, any competent originalist, you know, with the necessary, I don't know, level of uh, certification or qualification, you know, a law degree, uh, 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 you know, some publication record, um, some some record of of of. Um, you know, really learning the subject decently. If you can find an originalist who truly believes that the originalist method requires all uh, self-identified originalists to go back to the unamended constitution and work exclusively with that document. If, 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 if there's any originalist out there who's saying that, please share the name of that person with me because I don't know of any. I don't know of any. We're talking about originalism and originalists with respect to the quest for original meaning. It's always a question of, well, when was the provision in question written and ratified? That's the question. So obviously we're gonna be looking at different time periods if we're talking about the First Amendment and we're talking about the 15th Amendment or the 19th Amendment. We're going to be talking about different time periods. Um, but you know, this column is essentially saying uh, the originalists uh, want to take us all back to the unamended constitution. And um, really, this is unfair because the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment of the Constitution, you know, deserve our consideration. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not a significant problem with respect to current debates about constitutional interpretation. That is, this, this, the, the, the competent people on both sides know this. Um, so why does the New York Times run a piece like this? I don't know, except maybe, just maybe, and I hate to uh, advance such a notion, maybe the goal really is not knowledge. The goal is simply to get people on your side and um, if you get enough people on your side, it doesn't matter what's true and what's not, but your view will prevail. Okay, so you get what you want. It doesn't matter whether it's grounded in truth or not. You have an objective, you pursue the objective, even if it means bringing many, many people to your side and um, kind of um, uh, being complacent about the fact that they're just ignorant about the relevant matters. It's a little bit like the mob that takes shape after Julius Caesar is assassinated in um, the play by Shakespeare of the same name. Um, and you know, they're looking for this guy, Cinna, one of the conspirators. And they happen to stumble upon this guy, Cinna, the poet. And all that matters is, well, his name is Cinna, let's get him. And so they kill him, right? Oh, sorry, we wanted Cinna the conspirator, but your name was Cinna too, so close enough, okay? Uh, it's kind of scary. I don't want, um, I don't like the prospect of the people, meaning the political, community, uh, maybe not all the time sober, but we hope most of the time sober. I don't want the people to descend into a mob. Um, and th this is, I, I, I see this happening. Um, and um, students of mine who um, have a much greater presence on social media than I do. In fact, a student just um, last week at the end of constitutional law on Friday said, and maybe some of you are familiar with this. I think Chris Ross told me he was familiar with this. I don't know, somewhere in excess of 5,000, maybe 8,000 retweets of, 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 of this influential tweet, somebody saying, well, if you are an originalist, it means that you accept um, um, slavery as part of the constitution, um, right? So you can't, if you're an originalist, uh, uh, you go back to 1787, and that means slavery is part of 
uh, the act of interpreting the Constitution. So the students said, I, you know, I, I see this. And I said, well, did you respond? Did you try to uh, scotch this ignorance? And the response was no. <laughs> These people will leave me alone if I tell them the truth. So anyway, on that note, um, I'll bring my comments to a close. Just some things for you to consider. And I, 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 I welcome your comments and response. I spoke a bit longer than I thought. Um, so uh, thanks for humoring me. <laughs>